yeah maybe we should just mute everybody and then okay. um when questions pop up just chat nadine who's hosting which is info at Brooklyn play or, or the whole group okay great everyone's muted oh but i can't mute you right don't mute okay. me okay you are unmuted anders so, yeah if anybody has questions just use the chat and nadine will interject um and Nadine stopped me like at any time to explain something or answer a question. And then at the yeah. end, we can, we can leave some time for more questions, but yeah, so I'm on my desktop. So it's like a little tricky to walk around, but I want to just sort of give you an idea of my working space. Um, so I've been in this studio for about a year and I sort of like, immediately just wanted as much table space as possible um and then when i'm working on drawings i just kind of pin them up there and then everything behind me is uh, my studio mates nice little skylight there to just keep a few plants alive um i'm gonna set back down that's nice so where is your where is your studio so I'm like 10, like a 10 minute walk from Brooklyn Clay. So I'm in Prospect Heights, um, the still the same neighborhood as the studio. And then I'm really fortunate that Gus and I live just like another 10 minutes away. So everything's like, I have like this nice straight shot to studio work home and I travel that like twice a day. Nice. Um, so it feels pretty productive. But yeah, so since I moved into this space, I've been working on the same body of work um, for like about a year now, which is really rare for me. I'm usually like focused on um, short projects for a few months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been really nice to have like a return point for the work which has been or a starting point for the work which has been these sundials mm -hmm. um and they so the first one that i made was before i moved to brooklyn and i was in a studio that didn't have any windows or natural light mm -hmm. um and i sort of made it as like a, a reminder or like a uh joke for myself because i would so often leave the studio without realizing that the sun had gone down so i made like this scrappy little sundial and put it in the corner um and then when i moved here i just started making a bunch of them um and i realized that they could be um one, one thing like in my studio practice that creates a lot of anxiety is just not having a starting point. And I've always been like jealous of painters who at least know what they need to begin, which is like canvas, right. usually in a square on right. the wall. Yeah. And um, so these sundials have like been my starting point. So I'll grab one that's just this. Um, so the starting point is for me is a, is a location. Um, and so all of the sundials that I've made are for places that I've either, that are significant to me in some way, like whether I lived there or had, um, took a trip there and had like a meaningful experience there, but the the location gives me like what I need to start cutting out the shapes and getting the geometry. So that like, just the, I mean, this is like, a, they're really simple. It's kind of like, it's like a Boy Scout project sort of thing where um, you, you just look up your location and your latitude gives you the angle of, mm -hmm. of your gnome and then, um, 
you use a protractor to start drawing um, the hour lines and then you have a functioning sundial. And um, yeah, so it's nice to like have a starting point. And this is sort of like my blank canvas. And um, then like the surface and like imagery and glazing is like, sometimes it's just, uh, sometimes it's really specific to an environment and sometimes it's just more generalized. Like this one is for Seattle, which is where I was born. Um, and to me, that means uh, water, the Pacific Northwest, the Puget Sound. And so I just wanted to get some waves on there. Um, and the, this was actually like the first one that I made in this studio, mm -hmm. which is for Taos. Um, and this one is more really specific to that location. So just a little landscape study of the Pueblos there. And then the, like the colors or like the hour lines. Um, one thing that was really like specific to New Mexico, if you've ever been in, in that area, is the sunsets they get are these really unique like purple, pastel, purple to blue, and it's like changing throughout um, the day like that, which is something that I hadn't seen before. Um, and then the Taos, the Taos sundial also, it actually like started in the idea of a tea tray. And let's see if I can grab that one. So Anders, did you always work in, in the ceramic and ceramics or did you ever do anything with any other material? Yeah. Um, I, what is I, your background? My background. Yeah. Yeah. I got, like, I got into art through clay, through, through ceramics, um, and through specifically through functional pottery. And that was like in, in high school. Um, and then I spent a good amount of time in undergrad at the University of Minnesota working on functional pieces um, and that the studio I was at was like a very it's not so well known anymore because a lot of the old guard has sort of like phased out of there but um, that is where Warren McKenzie taught and Mark Ferris so there's like a really strong functional background there but at the same time I was that's when I started to like really venture off into different materials um, and working like more sculpturally or conceptually. And so this like new body of work has been probably the first time in like four or five years that I've like made anything that's all ceramic. And a lot of them are like all ceramic finishes with like glaze too. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it's also been the first time that I've like sat down and tried to make like a really in my mind like a really solid a really like decent cup um so i'll pull out this tea tray nice So would you say that you start off with a strong conceptual idea and or do you start off like knowing you want to work with clay what comes first do you do uh, any any sketching beforehand do you have some drawings that you do to work out your idea yeah i i think like in school when there was so much time to like spend thinking and like really like like incubating an idea that I thought was like had this conceptual significance um 
like I would spend a lot of time reading and writing and just like the, the body of work that I made like before this was mostly like idea or concept based, but now um, I don't, I don't usually start there. I usually start with like, like an image or uh, it's usually like an image or materials that I'm like wanting to work with. And um, so like for now that's been clay, um, but one, or it might be like other, other people's work that I'm like really inspired by and thinking about. So the way that these, this tea tray started and like these sundials for Taos um, were like when I was there on that trip for one thing that like that landscape was really inspiring to me, but also Taos and parts of New Mexico in general have like historically been a place where a lot of artists have like retreated to um like Georgia O'Keeffe and um Ken Price was like a big definitely a big influence for me and he did this body of work um I think a lot of it was done when he moved to New Mexico but called Happy's Curious and it was like inspired by folk pottery, Mexican folk pottery. Um, and so I'd been thinking about these sundials. So this is like a mini, mini one of Taos. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also like, I had spent so much time away from functional pottery that I wanted to like take a stab at it again. But I also have like, I wouldn't say that, I mean, maybe, maybe some of this, like there is some underlying concept that is like motivating the work, but a lot of it does just become um, like about surface and imagery and color and form. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like, I love like a good, a good cup and a good saucer. Mm -hmm. But I like there to be like a little bit of like something specific to it to think about while you're using it. And so I wanted to like figure out a way that it would make sense to have a cup and saucer like paired together and like really like linked in a pretty solid way. And so and I also was just like envisioning them on like this tea tray type um, type thing. And yeah, so could you talk a little bit about the surface treatment? Because I know you got really into that process with this tea tray. The, yeah. Um, so with this one, like, uh, so the way that I decided that these objects would would be linked was through like a saucer that functions as a compass. Mm -hmm. um, and so the surface, like for these ones, each one of these like sections or images is specific to Taos. Um, so like the monarch butterfly, I was thinking about the migration from like North America to Central Mexico, often like passing through Taos. Um, and then uh, these lavender is something that's um, grown or farmed there. And then this is like a specific cricket that is like a desert cricket and the specific type of cacti that's there. But so that's like the surface for the saucer. That's how that came about. It, it was again like location specific. Mm -hmm. um, and then do you mean like the surface for like the tray and the sundial and everything? I mean that also, yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't have to talk about that. I'll t well, the cup too is like, uh, I was thinking, of, again, thinking about the landscapes for these locations. It's like this one, 
I was thinking about a horizon line. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, <laughs> this one, like those purple gradients that um, I hadn't really seen anything like until I was in New Mexico. Um, but I want to quickly, I don't know if it, I want to see if I can show you how the compass actually works. Because that's, this was sort of like the aha moment where I felt like I was able to link the sundial and the cup. And so I whittled these little like wooden um, objects that house a needle that's magnetized. And yeah. so then the saucer, if filled, I got a sponge with water. <laughs> the idea is that you would pour out whatever tea or coffee you're drinking and then fill the center part with water and drop your needle. And then that would orient you to north. Yeah, that's beautiful. And then you would adjust your sundial to tell the time. That's great. So did you always want to make the whole tray out of clay or was there ever a time you thought about making the tray out of wood or metal or another material? Um, for this one, I just like it's, it's made sense to all be clay for me um, to just sort of, it just seemed appropriate if like I'm making like this tea tray thing, ceramic is historically like a material that is just used for that but I also was really wanting to get like the sandy um, texture to just sort of like reference the, the desert landscape in New Mexico. Um, yeah so maybe I'll grab uh, another is there any other questions about this one? I can grab. Uh, we had some questions about how the you did those super intricate drawings on the saucer. Oh yeah, the process for that. Um, yeah. Let me see. So I use carbon paper, um, and I trace on bisque, and then it's just a really slow painstaking process of filling in with color. Um, and are you using underglaze for that? Yeah, that's so all of the surface, all of these details mm -hmm. are underglaze just with a clear coat over it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if everyone can see, but all those little drawings are a little glossy and then there's that same sandy texture that's very matte which is really like texturally it's so beautiful yeah thanks it's like super rough yeah it's like a sprayed slip just because I wanted that sandy color um, but yeah super tiny tiny brushes and lots of time <laughs> Um, do you want to talk about spraying the slip or just explain what that means? Yeah, um, so basically the stoneware that we, that I was working with is typically like a sandy or like a lighter gray color, mm -hmm. but we, the studio sculpture clay is this really nice sandy yellow at Cone 6. Um, so I just mixed that up um, with water until it was like a consistency similar to underglaze and then just put it in the spray gun and just sprayed a thin coat over everything um, as greenware. And then like for your cup, did you spray that? The, yeah. the gradient? Yeah. 
Um, same thing with the cup. It's thrown with the clay that is like a light gray color. And then mm -hmm. as greenware, it was sprayed with that like sandy slip. And then after it was bisque fired, this is all, so like this fade is underglazed with just like a really small airbrush. So this is just like a taped off line. And then the, the liner and the rim are just our shop glazes. Nice. Um, yeah. And then let me grab another one. Or actually, since we're looking at trays, I'll show another one. This one's in progress that I'm working on. Um, so with the Taos one as well, like I started with the full, full size sundial and then I've been like going back to them and making these tea trays, at least for the ones that I like a lot. And so just sort of shrinking everything down. Um, so this one. Is just a miniature version of that for Seattle. Um, and the way that these are, the surface on these is similar to the cup where it's um, sprayed with underglaze and then, so sprayed with underglaze blue. And then from another direction, I don't know how easy you can see, but it's just dusted with white. Mm -hmm. And then on that sundial, what is the middle transparent blue? Is that glass or plexi? Oh, yeah. So this one is uh, filled with resin. So it's just cast. So I just create like a little mold around it and then pour the inside with blue tinted resin. Um, and then, yeah, so some of the, like the imagery for this one as well is all specific to Seattle, um, salmon and rainier cherries and seagulls are the things that remind me of Seattle. Uh, that's where I was born. And then, yeah, these ones will be linked again. So this will work as a compass and help you orient the sundial. And then what's that part, that circle in between the cup and, yeah. Oh yeah, so I've been playing around with like some of the cup and saucers like work as a compass themselves. And then I've also been doing some where it's the same idea, but you would just drop your needle in here. So it's just a little reservoir for it to to float. Okay. Uh, we had a question about why is there a tradition of hand painting in the US or if it was the UK that um, you would just use a decal for those illustrations on your saucer. So yeah, you want to talk about your hand painting and the tradition behind that? Um, I For me, I think that it was just about like I wanted there to be more of a handmade quality to it. I wasn't thinking about like any history there really, but, um, and it's, it's also like a skill that I'm more comfortable with, but there's, I think with the sundials, there's definitely like a handmade quality mm -hmm. to them. And I wanted that to just yeah. seem like the painting would sort of, go along with that, the hand, hand painting. Yeah, I think the hand painting definitely gives it a different feel and texturally, which that the texture seems important to you. If it was a decal, the texture would be all pretty flat and the, yeah. the hand okay. painting gives it a really nice quality. Thanks, yeah, I definitely thought about when, I'm like not, I'm not a trained painter or a drawer at all, so it, it's like like a seagull like that could take me like like three hours. <laughs> and when I've been in the middle of that, I've, I've thought about decals for sure. 
um, yeah, maybe something to try on another one. But I think that's a nice little tip for people, like using carbon paper onto your bisquare for drawing is a really nice way to make a drawing if you're not super confident. Yeah, yeah, it speeds it up for me. So I just like, I take, um, I just pull up an image on my computer and then trace it with um, drafting paper and then carbon paper underneath. And then I just take that down onto my saucer and it, that speeds it up quite a bit. So how do you come up with, I know you talked about it a little bit. Um, you said Seattle just reminds you of water, but how do you come up with this? Like you're not, it's not just painting water. You have these like waves that are textural. How do you arrive at that and decide for sure that's what you're gonna do? It's not like you have like, each sundial is different. So it's not like, you know, the Taos one, you had that nice gradient of the sunset. This one, it's waves. Mm -hmm. So you have like a, talk yeah. about how you. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm usually just looking for a way to make, the sculpture like represent the parts of that location that feel significant to me or like made an impact in some way. And so when, like when I visited Taos, like the two things, sometimes it's really easy to think about and like, or to decide what that might be. So for New Mexico and for Taos, like seeing the Pueblos, so that like, image that I had painted was like was important to me because to be like looking at architecture and civilization like that ancient made like a huge impact and then um so I just wanted I just knew I, I wanted that imagery mm -hmm. um but like for the Seattle sundials I don't like I don't think so much about the city there or what like what it looks like to actually be in the city. I think of the coast and I think of the water. So that one sort of just um, that seemed like the most significant thing to me anyways. And that's sort of like um, that's one thing that I really like about them is that they um, to me, they feel like really specific souvenirs of like a place and a time. And um, I, I think about them as having like uh, two different like ways of existing. So if they're like in the site that they're made for, or dedicated for, they are functioning. So they have like the ability to tell time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I like that when they're not in that location, so when I have the sundial for Seattle or Taos in my living room or on my coffee table, it's um, able to like really hold and like reflect different memories that I have about that location. And it also, I like knowing that they have like a, some sort of ability to function or do something and like that they're linked to these locations that are special to me. Mm -hmm. um, I see some drawings behind you. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, what let me, are those? I'll grab some and these are, oh, well here's the perfect thing for in case anyone hasn't used carbon paper. Mm -hmm. This is like what I use for the house one. So it just makes a nice little imprint and then I'm just filling it in with underglaze. Um, yeah, the drawings behind me. So I went, uh, Jen actually took uh, a group of us to the Judd house um, 
the Donald Judd house in Soho a little while back. And Donald Judd was really good friends with Don Flavin, Dan Flavin. And um, he had these drawings in his hallway. And uh, they were basically just little, little sketches of sculptures that he had made. And so if, if you know Dan Flavin's work, it's these fluorescent, often these like fluorescent tube light sculptures. And a lot of them are really big and they like, they're a light, light and space artist. Um, so they have like this big presence to them. And then he had just done these little sketches with crayon and colored pencil. And then, so each time he made a sculpture, whoever bought it, or whoever ended up owning the sculpture, he would give these little sketches to. And I thought that was great. Um, so I started making these, my sketchbook is like full of these little preliminary drawings, um, which are sometimes like ways of brainstorming how I'm gonna glaze something or how I'm gonna treat the surface or what imagery is gonna go on it. But there's also, um, notes on like the the degrees that I need to cut the triangles for or the hour lines. So I started doing these drawings that like go along with it. Um, and the idea is that I'll have, I like having one for each location. And so this is like ways to like think through color and form, but they're also like um, they're sort of like blueprints for the pieces so that I like have the information I need when I go and start cutting the slabs out. Nice. Um, oh, maybe I, maybe I'll show, I'll show one, one last piece and then if anybody has more questions, but I want to show. Yeah. Show us more pieces. Yeah. Um, we had questions about how long these pieces take. I know you said that one of those little seagulls could take you a few hours, but how long does the whole sundial take you? Um, the, I think the part that takes the longest is like the surface. Um, and then obviously like it, like being ceramic, the processes that he needed follow. So like letting these things dry really slow, but like actually like making the parts and the objects to then assemble is, is pretty quick. Like um, to actually make a sundial, I could, I could make everything that I need. Like I'll get all my slabs ready and that might be a couple hours one day. And then the next day, I can cut things out and assemble it pretty quick. And then I also, I recently started throwing the sundials. Um, so that's sped it up even faster. So I can just sit down at the wheel and basically throw it like just a big up, upside down plate. Mm -hmm. And then the slab is just, the only slab I need is for a triangle. So I can cut that out and put it together the next day. So to like make make it all as wet work is probably like a day or two. And then drying time, firing time, it's probably out of the best kiln in like a week or something. But I let them sit, like they sit for a long time while I'm like figuring out the coloring or the glazing on them. Um, I, so I don't know if that is like, there's probably not a clear answer for how long each piece takes, but, um, I think I probably finished like one or two a month, but I'm like working on a couple out of time, doing some surface on this one and then setting it aside for like a week and coming back to it. Um, but this is the last one I wanna show, which is for Brooklyn. And um, this was, I think this was the first one I made here. And it was, uh, exciting because if it were nicer weather I would take you up on my roof but this studio has a really great um, 
unfinished like rooftop that is has like a pretty much like a uninterrupted view of the city and it's it's kind of sad but they so they left some skylights throughout this building but for the most part they tarred and shingled over everything but basically when you go on the roof there's like these perfect little plinths to just set down these sundials um so it's a great way to like set them up and look at them up there that's nice um how do you view your work um in terms of pottery versus sculpture because all of your pieces have this uh functionality that's pretty important um but do you view them as sculpture functional pottery seems like there's like a strong link yeah um i think they're they're usually like a little bit of both like definitely the um like the tea trays that are like a cup and saucer paired with the sundial i i don't i'm it's they could be I, I like um, sort of calling things pottery when they are and sculpture when they are. Um, and I think that the cup is a cup, so it's pottery, but it's like tied to, tied to this little sculpture. And um, I like that they're just kind of like pushed together or like linked together in that way because yeah. um, Pottery is like where everything started for me. Um, and it's always been like a really soft spot for me. It's something that I love. Um, so finding a way for it to like link up with like sculptural ideas that I have has been really fun. So I, I think they're like both, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Katie asked if the drawings act as somewhat of a substitute for getting the work out there because they're faster, kind of like a way to document the progress. Um, yeah, I think like for me, they, they just sort of like they accompany the works like they wouldn't be, um, I don't think that they would, to me, they wouldn't necessarily like be worth making if they weren't linked to this other thing, like this sculpture or this sundial. Um, but they're definitely like the fastest thing that I do. And that's been something that's really, really nice. Um, it's, yeah, like, it's a pretty immediate thing. Um, which is nice because I don't really have anything in the studio that's like that. Um, so they do, I guess they do get out there faster. And I'm like usually lately, especially not having like freedom to go into the studio and work right now. Um, they have been a way for me to like keep putting work out there for sure. Um, so this butterfly on your Brooklyn sundial, that is ceramic. Can you hold that? Up this, yeah, this is not ceramic. Uh, this is like a little craft store butterfly, just just glued on there, epoxied on there. Um, and yeah, I think so. And then this one too. This one's sort of different than the others. This is just paint and colored pencil. Um, but the like this craft store butterfly is, uh, that's like probably one of the things in my studio that I've been most excited about in years. <laughs> and I think uh, something that, it's like there's, uh, I mean, there's so much, when we talk about craft, it's like, there's like a whole, genre of craft specific to ceramics um obviously but then there's also like the hobby shop like craftsperson that's like going to michael's to find their supplies and like 
get these little butterflies and get your colored pencils. Mm -hmm. And it's been really like fun for me to source materials and inspiration from like these sort of like NAF like places like uh, craft stores or even like the Home Depot like gardening aisle. They actually have like some real, <laughs> some really like killer sundials where there's like really corny like frogs like leaping off of things or like that sort of like gazing ball aesthetic like yard art. Mm -hmm. It's a place where I'm like really looking for inspiration right now. So I actually just ordered a uh, a glass butterfly that someone made on Etsy mm -hmm. and. I'm really excited for that to come. Nice. Um, and I see Duncan wrote in. Uh, obviously, this project could, when time is right, take you around the world. Um, so maybe, <laughs> maybe I need to do one uh, for London, and that'll be a good excuse to get there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a good way to think about travel or do you have anything, anyone coming next that you're working on? What what place are you working on? Do you have a few or do you just kind of focus on one location at a time? Um, I usually start uh, like a couple and just sort of like work through the surface on them. Um, the next like the next ones that I'm working on are just more versions of sundials for Brooklyn. Um, and I want to do some like tea tray sets like that. But as far as like, it's definitely something that's made me think about traveling more. And I actually haven't, like I haven't done that much traveling. Um, but the next place that I want to go uh, is Colombia, And I think that would be, like colors and landscapes there are obviously very different um, from anywhere else that I've been. So that's, that's somewhere I'm excited to, to get to at some point. Nice. Okay, well, is there any other piece that you would like to show in your studio? Anything else to show us? Um, hmm your favorite cup to drink out of while you're in the studio? Yeah, let me grab, let me grab a cup. Um, this one, yeah, this is my Monarch watching cup. Mm, um, nice. You've got the Monarch pattern on there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is the one that I use for, for tea most often. And did you hand paint all of those little monarch, that monarch pattern on the outside? Yeah, I did. So this was like the same process of carbon paper and then just brush and underglaze. Nice. Well. Do you have any past work hidden in a box? This says grad work, but I know I, all of, all of my past, the nice thing about this studio is that um, everything, like I started fresh when I moved in here. There was like n nothing to store, nothing to move along because this has been my first like semi-private studio um, since moving here. So all of the junk and all of the clutter is uh, in my parents' garage in Minnesota. That's convenient. Yeah, so we can do, we can schedule another session um, and I can dig through all those boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, well, thank okay. you everybody for coming to my studio. Um, thank you Nadine for moderating. 
thank you for showing us all of your beautiful work. Thank Anytime. you. Others. Thanks, everybody. Good to see all of your faces. Have a good rest of the day. Yeah. Thank you. See you next time.